Thank you for uh, attending my talk. It's still pretty early in the morning, so I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, storytelling in mobile games, uh, stories to go, narrative design for mobile games. Um, I'm especially going to draw from my experience uh, working at King. And, um, but to have a look at our agenda first, um, I'm first going to start with uh, who I am and why I'm talking about this. Uh, what narrative design, if done right, can do for your game. And um, then I'm going to delve into mobile games in specific, um, tell you about some best practices, some process tips, and then if there's still time, answer your questions. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is uh, Val Tamer. I'm a narrative and game designer, uh, currently working at King as a studio narrative designer. Um, I'm mostly working with a Candy Crush IP, um, specifically Jelly, which is uh, owned by the Berlin studio. Um, before that, I've worked at Idelic Entertainment, who are mostly known for their adventure games. Um, so that was a really different environment, actually. You can imagine um, working on text-heavy point-and-click adventures and then going to mobile games. It was uh, a drastic change, um, but I've also learned a lot. Um, in this. Um, oh yeah, also I've been an artist at Silent Dreams Games for some time, because uh, I'm also a little bit of a jack of all trades. <laughs> um, but this led me into the narrative design um, branch, which can be considered like a mixture between um, game design, game writing, and everything else. <laughs> Um, you will see why it is important to be a little bit of a jack of all trades when being a narrative designer um, as well. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about this is the reactions I'm getting when I tell people what I do for a living right now. Because I tell them, oh yeah, I'm a narrative designer on the Candy Crush IP. And they're like, Candy Crush is a story? What do you do all day? <laughs> and um, that's a fair point, because Candy Crush is no god of war. That is, that is certain. Um, but I feel like this question comes from a misunderstanding what narrative design is, as opposed to a game's story. Um, I think the expectations are that narrative design is the same as writer or author, and that it's a solitary activity, like you sit on your desk and you write all day and you write big documents and just text all day um, alone. Like you're like the one writer at the studio and all the others do their thing and you just like deliver the story at some point. Um, but that's not what a narrative designer does at all. Um, narrative design is designing the narrative experience of the player by using all aspects of a video game. So not only um, plot, characters, uh, world building, which is also part of it, um, but also um, uh, the visuals and the game mechanics and the sound. Uh, what does the player do? How do they do it? What's the sequence? So it's a very cross-functional um, job, actually, so that you have to collaborate with all other um, people in the team to ensure that the story that is experienced by the player um, works. And it's not only, oh yeah, this is the plot, go make a story with this, but it's more of a um, constant, um, like it's, it's lots of meetings, it's lots of discussions, it's lots of finding documents and um, finding the right answers to questions. Um, and it's more decision-heavy rather than text-heavy, especially in mobile games, where you usually don't find a lot of text unless it's a visual novel or something along those lines. So the thing is, why should we care about narrative design? Like, it's, it's the story or something? Like, most games don't need a story, right? Like, chess doesn't have a story. Yes, it does. Um, because when you look at the pieces of a chessboard, you see that there is um, that this is about a war between kingdoms. Um, there is an implied story in basically everything we do, even if it's abstracted. So um, you have no excuse. Um, so 
what good narrative design can do is um, create engagement so that the players actually do want to play the game and do want to keep playing it. Um, it can decrease friction between um, elements and actions. And um, you can imagine it like this. Um, uh, that players always intuitively understand what to do and what to do next, and that um, it's the difference between um, driving along a smooth road or along a road with lots of bumps on the way. Um, good narrative design also enables immersion, really getting lost in the world and what you do, um, and really feeling um, the story. Uh, and it can also give meaning to the players. It should give meaning to the players' actions so that they know why they're doing things and get emotionally involved because of this. Um, good narrative design can also improve uh, players' learning. And I don't only mean the educational and edutainment kind, but I also mean just understanding how to play the game. Um, like, what button do they have to press or what do they have to tap? Um, What's the process? What are the mechanics? And if the narrative design is good, um, it's going to come way more natural to actually understand how to play the game. But if you screw this up, um, then it can severely impair players' understanding of the game and slow them down so that they just um, try to navigate your game um, instead of actually playing it and enjoying it. So um, they won't go get into a flow, they won't have fun, they won't be emotionally attached, and they won't be motivated to play. So basically, when your narrative design sucks, then players will not be able to enjoy the game properly. And if they do, it's more like a challenge. <laughs> you know, like, like some players just like the challenge of playing a hard game, and bad narrative design makes a game experience harder. So. But um, usually, bad narrative design um, is a bad idea. Um, and I don't mean that there's little story, but bad narrative design is purposefully doing wrong things. Um, yeah, so after I've cleared that up, um, let's go into mobile games in specific, because they are a unique breed that is different from console games or PC games and have their own unique um, demands. Uh, mobile gaming is also a fun activity. It's, it's playful. But um, because of the nature of uh, smartphones, uh, they're played very differently. They're more like a habit. Um, you can also get into the habit of playing after work at home, but you always have your smartphone in your pocket. You can always take it out and play a round of Candy Crush. Like, you wait for the bus, you can play around. You, you commute, you play around. You have a break, you play around. You wait for a friend, you play around. So it, it becomes a habit um, uh, rather easily. Um, and that leads us to when do players um, even play on their phone. And as I said, it's not like in their living room, but it's, um, uh, it's during their commute, um, during downtimes, like lunch break, or when they wait for somebody, um, and also in the evenings, like at home, um, uh, in front of the TV or in bed before they sleep. Um, because some players might not even have a dedicated console or a PC for gaming, because not everybody has that. But most people nowadays have a smartphone, so it's like the lowest hanging branch of getting your uh, game fix. You already have the phone. Mo a lot of apps don't even cost uh, much to download or don't cost anything at all because they're free to play. So you literally can use something you have and just press a button and boom, you have something to play. So um, yeah, there are a lot of people who don't have any other gaming console. Um, so they will also play at home. Um, but the thing about the smartphone is it's not a dedicated gaming console. It's um, a lot of things. So um, all these different things create an expectation of how we interact with the phone. Um, we, we, we open it up and we look if we have a message on WhatsApp. Then we open Facebook and l have a look at the feed. Then we go into our emails and check if we have something. Then we go to Tumblr, Twitter. We, we just go to all these different sources and have like short um, uh, units of information. And um, 
this has shaped the way we interact with the smartphone. We want quick articles, um, quick reads, um, and then go from one source to the other. So this means for the atten uh, attention span of our players that they have a pretty short attention span and not a lot of time because of the nature where they actually play. Like when you wait for the bus, maybe you have five minutes, maybe 10, but you don't have two hours to get into the flow like you need with some open world games where you, where one unit has to be two plus hours. No, they only have 10 minutes. Um, and they also could do something else during that time. So oddly enough, mobile games don't necessarily compete only with other mobile games, but also with other apps. So um, like, would you have thought that uh, among Candy Crush's biggest competitors are like social networks and uh, streaming services and music and messaging and um, news outlets and the weather? <laughs> um, this is all something you have to take uh, into account. Um, and to make it worse, mobile games don't only uh, compete for attention on the phone, but everywhere, like in real life. While, they have, uh, while players have the phone in their hand, they do something else uh, a lot of the time. 56% um, uh, watch TV or stream videos while they play mobile games. 37% uh, listen to music at the same time, and 36% eat food at the same time. So a lot of competition for attention here. So how, how do we handle this? If players don't have the attention to read our cool stories, um, but need good narrative design for a smooth experience, how do we give them that? And um, I will try to give you some, some tips of, um, yeah, based on what I've learned uh, working at King um, and what I've learned working at Daedalic Entertainment and um, what I've learned just talking to peers. Uh, the thing about mobile games, as you might have noticed, is that they have unique requirements in terms of attention. So what we need to ensure is that um, these games are easy to pick up and learn. Um, can be played in really short play sessions, like one minute to five minutes. Um, can be understood and enjoyed even if players don't pay attention at all. So forget about long explanations. Forget about um, uh, writing something down and going like, oh yeah, it's here, so players will understand. No, they will skip the text, they will not understand. Um, also, you have to account for minimal core gameplay interruptions. Um, because players want to pick up and play. They don't want to watch a five-minute cutscene before they can play the next level. Um, but the thing is, some games are actually um, using narrative as their core gameplay. Um, so it's not like you can't give them texts or cutscenes. It depends on the, the genre. And um, another additional a challenge is that if you have a life game, so a game that is um, updated um, constantly, gets new content um, every uh, X weeks, um, then you have to account for making it a long-term experience. You can have a completed like story and players will get through it in a month, and then how are they supposed to continue playing? Like, How do you account for a, a long-term play? And um, this is something that uh, must be accounted for in the story, uh, storytelling structure. Like, do you want this to be a seasonal story um, or have episodic content? Um, emergent storytelling that doesn't actually um, rely on crafted design? Um, or do you want to give them um, a world and no plot within that world? And then is that world engaging enough to keep them around for the amount of time that you want them around? Um, and you have to think of repeating important information sometimes. Because if people have played a game for two years and um, you rely on them remembering something from two years back, well, <laughs> good luck. Um, in addition to these unique requirements, um, you can um, use these like narrative design pillars of kind of like a best practice um, guideline, just what to, to look at when you um, uh, deal with narrative design for your mobile games. 
and these basically work for all games, and actually. Uh, the first one that I want to go into is uh, conventions, as in um, expectations and rules. Um, depending on your genre and uh, story genre and theme and brand, because um, a lot of mobile games are actually brand games um, based on something else, uh, adaptations of TV shows or movies or something else. Um, so in terms of conventions, what you have to become aware of is uh, what are the expectations for the device, which I've just told you before, like the short information uh, uh, units and um, short play sessions, etc. Um, then become aware of what are the expectations for your game genre, what have other people um, done that uh, created games in the s of the same type, uh, what are the brand expectations, um, how do these expectations translate into a video game format, and what are the theme expectations. Um, but it's not only about what um, the world has given you in terms of expectations, but also what kind of expectations do you give the players in your advertising, in um, the onboarding experience when they first open up the game? Um, are they aware of what kind of story experience they will get? Will they be surprised or frustrated later on because things change or they um, experience something unexpected? Um, and also, what are the players' cultural expectations in terms of the content and symbolism and what's going on? And I've already uh, jotted down piggybacking error because that's like a, an important um, keyword, which is basically using established symbolism um, to have a mental shortcut for your players to understand something at first glance and you don't have to understand, uh, you don't have to explain everything, anything. Um, for example, if you have a red bar and there's a little heart next to it, well, it's obvious that it, this is the life bar. If the bar is blue, it's more likely to be a mana or magic um, bar of some sort. Um, and um, yeah, these are conventions that you can use in order to um, communicate a lot in a really short time frame, like at first glance. And in mobile gaming, it's all about communicating a lot by um, using um, a little. Um, yeah, uh, two examples for the conventions and expectations th thing is um, the f game Futurama Game of Drones, um, which is based on the popular science fiction satire uh, cartoon. Um, it actually features um, a lot of narrative, as in story. Uh, and also uses the characters and the, s the visual style and the brand of humor known from the show. So it delivers on what a player would expect in, um, uh, in terms of how much story do I get? What are the characters like? And um, the other example is uh, Love Island, the game. Uh, Love Island is a, a British reality TV show where a bunch of attractive people get put on an island and have to date one another. Um, and this game is basically a dating sim, but um, with, a, um, with an episodic structure because it is based on a reality TV show which is presented in an episodic structure. And the themes are exactly what you would expect. Um, romance, betrayal, innuendo. And um, this, this game genre took the brand's expectations and translated them into a mobile game experience. Uh, as a little um, guideline, how to keep those conventions um, during production is just decide on things and document them. Don't just vaguely think like, oh yeah, it's, it's obvious. Like, everybody knows the brand here. Like, why would we have to write anything down? But games, especially live games, stay in production for years on end and people will leave and come and projects are gonna be moved around to other studios and um, it's very likely that um, even if everybody um, who is with the project in the beginning stays for years on end, people forget things. Uh, even if you've made the decision three years ago, you will have forgotten what you have decided. So um, document everything you decide. Um, document how long your texts are uh, gonna be. What's the purpose of 
specific units? Like, is this more of a tutorial element? Is this more of a, a player motivation element? Um, when do we deliver what? In which context? Um, and always make sure to balance clarity and um, character in your texts, because clarity is basically making clear what the player is supposed to draw from this information, and character is um, matching the tone, giving insights into the world and the characters. And um, you should always try to strike the right balance there. And sometimes you should probably make decisions when you deliver what kind of information. Like, is this environment something where you should only deliver pure, unflavored tutorial texts, or is this something that should be um, more quirky? As long as it stays consistent, um, it's, it's already a good step in the right direction. Um, also in terms of addressing the player. Like, are players part of the world, or characters aware of the player? Do they address them directly? Do they say, hi, player, please help us? Or is the player like an implied part of the world? Do they have an avatar? Um, you would think that this is obvious, but sometimes you will find that the longer a project uh, continues, the more the opinions and actual implemented stuff will differ. And then you will go like, oh, actually, we have something that ad addresses the player directly there, but there the um, character is actually an avatar, so we actually have conflicting uh, roles of the player in the game world. We should have thought of what we want to do and kept the convention. Um, yeah, uh, documentation is everything. Um, also stuff like, do you want mascots for your features, as in, um, this character always pops up when it's um, about receiving a booster for your game, or this character is for um, tutorial texts, or this character is for long-range weapons, and that character is for magic spells. Um, if you tie characters to specific game elements, um, that makes the learning and the emotional attachment way easier um, as well. All of this includes localization, by the way. If you want to have uh, a specific um, text length or a specific wittiness or wordplay in there, just document it for the people who localize it, because otherwise they will create literal translations that totally miss the mark or the tone, and um, it's, it's vastly underestimated how much localization uh, matters. Um, and here, uh, let me give you an example from something I've worked on. Um, this is the uh, adventure book in Candy Crush Jelly. It's basically like an achievement uh, uh, collection. And um, what I've defined there was, number one, use the correct names for the blockers, because sometimes it's not that obvious, especially if it's not um, in the game a lot. For example, this, this dude in the middle um, on top is called Monkling, but I've seen people call him uh, Monkey, and if, if something has a defined name, use that defined name. <laughs> Don't call it something else without a good reason. Um, so in this case, I, um, I made sure that I used the correct names, I tried to make it playful to fit the candy tone, but still badass because you achieved something. Um, and I used all, uh, alliterations for all the achievements because alliterations are fun. Um, so in the end, we got achievements called Cupcake Crasher, Swirl Scientist, Monkling Master, Puffler Pro, Jelly Juggler, and Black Candy Buff. Um, yeah. Uh, let's continue with um, the narrative design pillar of consistency, um, which is basically making sure that all the conventions that you set up um, will stay consistent throughout the game. But it's not only that. It's also that all the narrative elements um, inside the game and the franchise um, are coherent. And by that, I mean, does the picture that you see match the text that you get? Um, if something is called um, I don't know, the, the golden crown, but what you see is, uh, uh, is I don't know, like uh, a pudding. You're like, 
Why? And you'd be surprised how often that happens when there's no narrative designer around to look people uh, over the shoulder. It's like the artists are doing like, oh yeah, this would look really cool. I'm going to do this and use that icon and we can visualize it like that. And then on the other uh, side of the room, like people think about how to name it. It's like, oh yeah, it's called this and that because it's always been called that way. Then you combine it and you're like, that won't make sense. <laughs> um, so just make sure that everything within the game always is consistent uh, with each other. That also applies to characters. Like, does the character fit the situation? Are they out of character? Would it be weird to use this character for this feature? Um, yeah, and just try to make sure that the voice and tone of your game is met, um, that you have a consistent um, way of naming things, and is it consistent with what you would expect from the real world? Like, if there's a heart and you collect it, do you get life? Um, and if it isn't consistent, is it sufficiently set up so that people still understand it? Yeah, just as tips, just think of all elements in the game as um, narrative elements, um, document all your narrative decisions, and um, read those narrative decisions. Yeah, even Candy Crush has a lore bible, so if you're with... Uh, uh, wondering, um, there's actually a lot of stuff to document here uh, as well. Cool. Um, next one I want to go into is clarity, which is basically, is everything um, communicated clearly? How the world works, um, what the player is supposed to do, and um, uh, yeah, like as in, are the instructions clear and do they get uh, reminders on the way, which would be the signposting. Um, do they know what their short and long-term goals are? Do they get feedback for what they're doing? And um, do they understand it even if they skip texts? Um, yeah, just general tips. Give the right information at the right time. Don't over-explain. Don't use too much text. And rather try to use visuals and animations and symbolism to deliver your meaning. Um, and repeat information when needed, but never sacrifice clarity for the sake of making it sound cooler. Just um, uh, f focus on that. Uh, yeah, an example here for signposting would be, in the beginning, we got this um, context um, of uh, the, the leprechaun being assigned um, on de to decoration duty on St. Patrick's Day. Then in the meantime, you can um, uh, see what the goal is. Like in the beginning, he's like, oh, I need gold. Let's collect gold stars. In um, then when you open your quest menu, you still see, like, collect all the stars. And then in the end, you get feedback whether you've collected enough stars or not. Yeah, this is also going into context. Um, does the narrative design sufficiently set up the context of what the player is doing, um, what's happening in the world right now and in general? What are the motivations? What's the emotional context? Just in general, what am I doing? How am I doing it? And why am I doing it? And my tips here is find elegant solutions, say a lot by using a little, and use as many mental shortcuts as possible. Um, and make sure to set up uh, everything so that players don't do something because they just, they just think they have to, um, but make them understand why. And also always test your assumptions on what players will understand or feel. Um, yeah, this is super important, um, yeah. Here is uh, another example for setting the context. This adventure book is basically that um, uh, Mr. Toffee, the, uh, the mayor of Candy Town, um, sends you on an expedition to explore the Cloud Kingdom. And um, yeah, these are your expedition batches for finding out different things. Uh, yeah, and lastly, character. Um, does this uh, text or a visual convey the game's identity and the character's personality and the current mood? And um, do players care? Are they intrigued? Are they uh, emotionally uh, involved and invested in the conflict's resolution? Um, yeah, and again, refer to guidelines. Um, and uh, don't sacrifice clarity for character. It's always the same learnings, basically. And um, yeah, are there other ways to convey what you want to say? Also, in terms of character, um, you can do little writing practices to get to know um, them better. Uh, nothing is ever wasted, even if it's not player-facing. An example here for character would be, these are the bad guys in Candy Crush Shelley, and um, they're the feature mascots for the boss modes. So um, basically, the competitive um, mode where you fight against the NPC. And 
they are set uh, up as the antagonists um, to give you that emotional um, flavor. Yeah, and uh, real quick, I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, process tips. Um, for narrative designers, say a lot with short texts. Know your genre and player habits and test your ideas and iterate. Also involve sensitivity readers. Um, uh, at your company, attend meetings early in the process. Don't wait until they come to you. Um, learn the production uh, timeline and partner with other disciplines and always share your work and talk to people. And for everyone else, involve narrative designers in meetings early on. Story is not something you add on later. It's, um, uh, it's something that should be there from the very start and should evolve with the game. Um, ask them questions, learn about their craft, and don't be afraid to share your own ideas and thoughts. Everybody can be a storyteller. Um, narrative design is a craft that you should need experience in, but in general, when you have a good idea, a narrative designer is likely able to put it in there it's, if it's really good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Valentina Tamer, narrative designer at King. Thank you so much. It was thank very you. insightful. And yes, we're out of time, basically. <laughs> we already, we're already 15 minutes behind schedule. Thank you so much. You'll, you'll be around all day. I am around all day. So there you, you can just ask me questions directly. Perfect. <laughs> and if you have anything else, you yeah. see all the emails and Twitters and LinkedIn's. Thank you so much, Valentina. Thank you. All right.